Welcome to the Hilton Center for Business. My name is Jason DeMello. I'm a professor in the Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship. And unfortunately, our director, Dr. David Choi, couldn't be here today because of some travel complications in Germany. But he did want me to thank each and every one of you, uh, students, faculty, LMU community, and our Los Angeles community members for being here tonight. Uh, tonight marks our 58th uh, Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur Lecture Series an event where we honor the best of the best in our business world. Our speaker tonight is certainly among the best technology entrepreneurs on the planet. He founded Belkin International here in LA in his parents' garage close by and has since grown it to be one of the largest technology companies connecting people all around the world. In fact, I read that if you own a computer in the United States, there's an 80% chance that you have a Belkin product. If you own a smartphone, there's a 90% chance that you have a Belkin product. Also, anybody has seen the show HBO Silicon Valley? Put your hands. Uh, that's actually filmed here in Silicon Beach, and it's filmed at Belkin's headquarters just down in Playa Vista. So outside of his success in technology, Mr. Pipkin lives a life of service, giving back through phil philanthropy, volunteerism, and education, uh, and is really committed to this community. He truly embodies the values that we hold sacred here at LMU. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm LMU welcome to Mr. Chet Pipkin. Thank you. Very, very kind of you. Good evening, everyone. Everybody doing OK? Happy, happy Thursday. Um, so let me just kind of kick things off uh, just by giving a huge thank you to LMU um, in lots of ways, um, lots of different folks and themes um, are, are really intertwined with a lot of the work that's taken place at uh, Belkin. Uh, we're really impressed with the passion and the quality of folks that we are able to work with here and um, uh, all of you are in really good Company. Speaking of good company, uh, it's, it's my honor to have known for many, many years um, the illustrious Dr. Draper. Uh, thank you for allowing me to spend a couple of minutes here and uh, feel uh, even better to be here with uh, his uh, lovely wife, Lori. So um, good to see you. Um, I also want to thank, uh, where did she go? Darlene, thank you for giving me such a beautiful greeting. And Dr. DeMello, what a beautiful job being here as an undergrad. And then coming back here to put your big stake in the ground, really making things happen. Kind of, kind of, kind of good to see you. Okay, so um, uh, a little bit about me. Um, more than a tech guy, I'm a, I'm a history guy. And more than a history guy, I'm a, I'm a people guy. So we're going to go through a little bit of tech and a little bit of business, but you're going to see some other themes kind of weaving in and out of here too. So this is a photo of um, my dad's aunt and uncle and uh, their kids. And uh, my mom was from North Dakota, my dad from Oklahoma. Uh, my dad was a machinist, more than a machinist, he was an artist. Uh, it was back in those days, it was by hand that you had to figure out how to make the machines work to kind of form and cut metal. And the work that he did went into the Saturn rocket that put people on the moon. Um, but he never really talked about it. Um, in that way. And there's a special gift that I got from my mom and my dad. Just kind of focus on doing the right thing and doing the right thing for others. And there's a, there, there's a good shot that, that things will come through for you. So I'm leafing through the National Geographic magazine one day and I come across this very photo and I go, wow, this looks like Oki migrant people. And then I look at the caption and it says it's Myra and Frank Pipkin. So I call my dad and I go, do you know these people? He says, know them, it's my aunt and my uncle. And it turns out that the Library of Congress sent people out to this migrant camp 
to record the folk songs that were being created then. And Myra Pipkin there was the most prolific singer. The internet had just come to pass. My dad didn't have any experience with the internet, right? So he's at Belkin, sitting at my desk. I call up this Library of Congress photo, and for the first time in his life, he's able to hear his aunt sing at this camp. And I love this photo because it represents to me that it's got nothing to do about any of the tech that we use, but rather it's these really personal, emotional moments that come to life for us that are enabled by tech that otherwise would uh, never happen. So this is a photo of uh, where the dirty dishes come in at uh, Belkin. My first job was working as a dishwasher during lunchtime at Lawndale High School. Can you imagine what those trays look like? They didn't look like this. There was anything and everything coming in through that window. And um, my pay for taking care of the dishes at the lunch hour with the stuff flying in through this window uh, was I got my high school lunch paid for. But the real pay that I got was, was a high degree of empathy for people that are on the other side of that window when we go to stick our tray in there at any kind of cafeteria. So if you could do me a huge favor, when you go and you put your dishes through that window, just take a few extra seconds so the person on that receiving side has, 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 has got just a little bit less muck to them sort of work through. And it was pointed out to me in later years that there's a word for that feeling that I have for people in that spot. And that word is empathy. And it turns out that empathy is an item that kept cropping up in my life over and over and over again. So that's me, that's me a few years ago. <laughs> How do I look? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even if you don't think I look that good, you just kind of give me that positive reinforcement. So my second paying job was working as a day camp counselor at the YMCA. You spent time at the Y. Huh? Um, and working with at-risk kids. And it was a program called NIPM, the National Youth Program Using Mini Bikes. And the concept for this was that the mini bikes would be a draw for the kids. We'd use the mini bikes to teach them responsibility. And then they got the reward for that. And here, I got lessons in empathy, that there were some people that hadn't had the foundational gifts that um, I received as a kid and that there were people out there that would benefit receiving some level of love and some level of service. So this is a photo of the first graduating class of Rise High School. So I'm fortunate enough to be involved with some people that started to found public charter schools. These are called the Da Vinci schools are right down the road here from us in uh, Hawthorne. We're building a nice, beautiful new uh, campus right by the um, space station. Rice High School is our latest school. Rice High School is focused on foster kids and homeless kids and out of school kids. And it turns out that for those of us that haven't come from a stable home, and we get moved around a lot, our school system doesn't do a good job of transferring credits over and, 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 and ramping kids up at the new school. And kids often don't do well. They don't feel successful, and they leave school. 
So what RISE does is we take the high school and we follow these kids around. Why? Because they matter. And uh, their gift back to me, that's me in the center. Can you see me? There I am. I'm the, I'm, 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 I'm the outlier there in the, in the age area, but not in the energy area or the passion area. And um, uh, so I invite you to, um, to, uh, to think about passions of, of your own and the gifts you uh, might be able to give to others. So this is the house that I was raised in, and um, this, is, this is the house where uh, Belkin, Belkin launched. It's in uh, Hawthorne, also just a... Uh, just a few miles south of here. And here is the most beautiful woman in the world, my wife, Jan, who is also right there. And so uh, Jan and I met um, doing volunteer work at the YMCA, specifically for the California YMCA Model Legislature and Court Youth and Government. Any YNG alumni here? You've got, oh, wait, there is, nope. You've got to be kidding me. Okay, all of them are out debating or doing something like that. Um, and so this is Jan and I, this is at a, this is at a trade show in the, um, in the um, early days of uh, Belkin. This is in Las Vegas, so. It was probably a wild night that, that night, right, Jen? Okay. Shh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we, will, we will go on to another topic. <laughs> so now I want to talk about design. Uh, one of the great technology leaders, one of the great entrepreneurs of our time is Steve Jobs. And Steve had a real appreciation for people and people's experiences and design. And Apple really embraced the beauty of a font and really celebrating the font. And so this is just at the time that desktop publishing was replacing typewriters. An issue with the font was that if it was created on an Apple operating system, it would only print on a Apple printer. And we thought that there might be a chance to be of service to people, not only in a nonprofit way, but that we might be able to be of service to people and, and make a couple of bucks on it. And, and for those of you who, who are purists in the service side, yeah, I sold myself out a little. Um, and of those of you on the business side, good news, you can have empathy, you can have love for other people, you can be overwhelmingly dedicated to service, and you've got an opportunity, a chance, where you might be able to make a couple of bucks. And so one of our first inventions was to allow people who had created and were celebrating this font and the beauty of this graphic arts and desktop publishing and with the Belkin Hamlet, you could preserve that and print that on any parallel printer in the world. Is that amazing or what? It was pretty amazing in 1984 or whatever it was. All right, now I'm going to switch to just kind of a big thought. You, you guys like thinking big thoughts here in these academic circles, right? Um, so an invitation I would give to you when it comes to some possible big thoughts, is think about where there's an awful lot of demand and an awful lot of capacity. But the demand exists in some way that it can't get to the capacity, and the capacity is unused. And as an example of when really exciting big things can happen, when demand and capacity meet a way to efficiently meet one another, um, 
can be brought to life as we think about the way that we get around in our cars. For decades, I would travel from point A to point B, and I would be delighted to have somebody drive me there. I'd be delighted to even pay them a certain fare. At other times, I'd be short of money, and I would be delighted to be of service to others to get them from point A to point B. And there's millions of other people around the world just like me. But there was no efficient way to do an adequate background check on somebody where I would feel adequately safe to get in their car or for that person to let me in their car. There was no way to do an e-payment. There was no way to do navigation. And as these modules of technology were developed, other folks were clever enough to see the excess capacity and the demand, stitch these modules together and uh, offer up services like Lyft and Uber. So I'll invite you just to think big thoughts about where there's a whole lot of capacity and a whole lot of demand where technology might be able to bring those two together. And if you can think of something that's really big that'll do that, run up here and tell me, and we're going to work out a special deal together. Okay? I'm going to cut you in a big, uh, big, big, uh, big a piece of the pie. So Belkin's all about delightful user experiences. So just like the Hamlet allowed you to kind of preserve that font, we're all about people. And this empathy theme is our primary theme. What is it that is hard for people to do and what is it that we can do at Belkin that makes their lives a little more delightful, a little more fulfilling, um, a little easier? And that's Belkin's sweet spot. Another big thought is um, smart cities and um, connected cities. I'm just going to leave you with that thought for a second, and I'll come back to that in just a couple minutes. So now, of course, I'm here, I work at Belkin, I need to give you a short Belkin commercial. So, because we want penetration at LMU to go from, did you say 90% chance of having a Belkin item if you have a smartphone? 99% uh, of you must have smartphones, so we want to get the penetration at least to 99%. So, um, how many people watched the launch of the uh, iPhone 8 and the iPhone 10? Uh, a couple of weeks ago. How many people were more focused on Apple TV or the watch or the phone versus Phil launching the Belkin wireless charger there? <laughs> Wasn't this the most exciting part of that moment? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, it's the most exciting part of the presentation for me and a few of the other folks at uh, Belkin. So Belkin's role is to kind of figure out what hardware allows us to do in this moment, what software allows us to um, do in this moment, versus what we really want to do as people. And do you really want to sit and try to figure out where your Belkin cable is, and then you've got to figure out where the end is to the phone and plug that in? Or do you just want to take your phone and just slap it down on something that, that's um, close by? So we're there. Hopefully hopefully making experiences a little bit more delightful. Another part of what it is we do falls under the, the Linksys brand, and we acquired Linksys out of Cisco a, a few years ago. Um, we're on record as saying that more and more of everything in our car, when it is we're on the go, when we're at home, is going to be connected. We have no idea how many devices are connected in our home. At, at your, your home, when you're home, do you think it's less than five? Do you think it's six to ten? 
11 to whatever, you're not going to participate with me at all. Yeah, all, the, all of the, all of the um, hands go up. Um, we think about like our smartphone or our tablet, maybe our, 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 Mac, our MacBook being um, connected, but today, of course, increasingly, it's our TV, our Roku, our Apple TV. All of these things allow us to watch television, uh, and it's not even TV, right? Content in, in ways that people just didn't do 10 years ago. So demands on our Wi-Fi in the home are higher than them ever. And I could tolerate an intermittent Wi-Fi signal when I had a laptop and it was doing things with data in a batched, uh, on a, in a, in a batched kind of uh, process. I can't tolerate watching Game of Thrones and um, having the image stop and go and the audio being, being um, out of sync. So, so Belkin's been hard at work um, creating um, um, the um, absolute best Wi-Fi for um, anybody's home. And Belkin likes future-proofing everything we do. So if we've done things correctly, if the iPhone 10 you buy in a few weeks has got the ability to charge faster a year from now, that charger we saw should keep pace. That's a, that's a reason to come to the Belkin brand. And a future-proofed element of what it is that we're doing around connectivity in the home is that uh, Velop has Wi-Fi, it's got Zigbee, it's got Bluetooth, um, and more and more over time, we're going to have more and more things connected that um, come, come together in that way. Anybody heard of the brand Wemo? A few of you. So Wemo's our point of uh, view around connected devices in the home. It takes anything that's a dumb appliance, you plug it into a Wemo switch in, in your wall, you can now have complete control over that through rules, you can get notifications, you can do it from your app, you can do it through a natural language processor like um, Amazon Alexa or uh, Google Home, and uh, soon um, Apple Siri. Belkin's always trying to work on uh, what's, what is the next really big thing, and one of the items that we're working on that might be the really, really big Next thing is uh, FIN. What FIN is, it's a piece of hardware you put anywhere in your home plumbing, and it's got a water pressure sensor. And then any time that we use water in our home, whether it's our kitchen sink, we take a shower, we um, irrigate our plants, um, we, we release and turn off water with a with a certain pattern. Our dishwasher's got a pattern, our washing machine's got a pattern. As the water pressure changes, as we release that water and then turn the water back off, it creates a, a signal off of this water pressure sensor that is inside of a, a thin unit. From that, we have a signature on every appliance, every faucet that is in a home and we can now tell how much water is being used by your shower versus your outside irrigation. Um, and we are going from a water bill. I bet you not many of you ever see a water bill, huh? For those of you who do see a water bill, I'm going to imagine that it doesn't make a lot of sense to you. I'm also going to guess you pay it because if you don't pay it, they're going to turn your water off. But it's not because you understand the bill. So with Finn, we're going to take a huge leap forward and um, everyone's going to know everything about their water usage in their home. And that'll bring us back to um, smart cities. Another big thought that we entertain at Belkin is that smart cities are never going to happen until we have a lot of insight on um, each one of us in that city. So a lot of us use navigation now to get from point A to point B. 
if all of us are using navigation, we could aggregate all of that data together because now we know where millions of people are and where it is they're headed. And we can change the lanes in the road. We can change the way in which we're treating the traffic signal patterns. And we can adjust that to this aggregated data we have to most efficiently get people from point A to point B. With a breakthrough like Finn, our policymakers can think about water in a really different way. If we want, we now have the capability to charge one rate to an elderly couple who is on a fixed income and a completely different rate. I shouldn't pick on you, right, Dr. Draper? But let's, I'm sure this isn't the case, right? But let's assume that he's got a patch of grass, right, that he insists on watering. Um, and I'm picking on him because I definitely have that at, at, at my house. If I want to choose to keep running my outside irrigation at a disproportionate rate, there's a lot of us who feel that we should charge a subsidized rate to the elderly couple who's just using enough water to shower and to cook their food and a punitive rate, a much higher rate, to those of us that are not being conscious about our water usage. So we think the breakthrough in smart cities will be this, this uh, data that uh, all of us are creating on an individual basis starting to get ag aggregated in a, in a, much, in a, in a much, much, much bigger way. Everything hasn't been easy for Belkin. Everything hasn't been easy for me. We were in business in that garage um, and a, a company that, that we were doing business with filed for Chapter 11. They filed for bankruptcy. When that happened, there was no way for us to survive. We needed the bills to be paid from them to have the cash to be able to do what it is we had needed to do. The company was started with $1,500 worth of savings. There was no place to go. I was lucky. My parents had enough courage to loan me 25,000 bucks. $25,000 they didn't have. The only asset they had was their home and they, and they um, took a loan out on their house. Fortunately, I was able to pay them back over the years <laughs> and they probably got maybe just a little bit uh, uh, more because we're a, we're a close, we're a close family and it, and, and, it, and it all worked out okay. In our early days, we built everything in the United States. And one day, somebody came knocking at our door and said, hey, do you want to buy this product from us? And it was a product that we were making and they quoted us a cost that was a quarter of what it cost us to build this thing. And I go, oh my goodness. We are, we are doomed. So we flew to Taiwan and we started, started, started manufacturing there. And there's been a lot of other moments in time when things looked like we weren't going to be able to make it. In every one of those cases, it was somebody through advice, counsel, their experience, some of the times their money, who um, helped us through this. Right. Have a network of, of people you feel safe with and who feel safe with you that um, you can bond with. And I recommend as much as you can to hang out with the winners in the one circle and hang out with the other folks in need trying to stay conscious of an opportunity that I may have to be a service to somebody else, to be able to practice some of the empathy that I've picked up along the way. And I've never done it expecting anything in return. 
But my own experience has been, no matter how much that I ever try to give away, the gifts come back at a high, high multiple. Thank you for giving me your precious time and allowing me to share a few thoughts with you. So I think I said we we're going to be done at 6.35, and if my Apple Watch isn't broken, it's 6.35. Okay. All right, so we will open up to questions, and Mike will be in charge of the mic. So uh, raise your hand if you'd like to add, <laughs> ask a question. That is convenient. Yeah. How's it going? Um, for So you believe that the end goal for Finn is to apply these punitive and subsidized rates, correct? Um, I think one of the possible positive outcomes of Finn will be that, yes. What do you believe like the current um, relevance of Finn is today? Well, so um, it's my belief that most of us want to do the right thing. And if I'm, I want to do the right thing in regards to my utilization or overutilization of water, data would be really helpful to me because I don't know how water gets used in my home. Yeah, for me and for all of us, right? And a whole like... So like, like the city can understand who's using what resources. Yeah, so both. So first at a individual home level, and then in a neighborhood level, and, and then across the um, whole city. But it, if I don't have appreciation for how my water's being used now, I, I'm not as well informed as I could be as to how, how to use my water better. The other big one is many of us do better when we get a reward for what it is we've done, whatever that reward is. And so if I'm using more water than I could be, and I take some actions, and I'm actually using less water, I would love to be able to see what sort of worked and, and how much it worked. Then I can feel the reward of that accomplishment, which then incents me to um, do more. Water is the most precious resource we have. You know, the wars over the last decades, some of those have, have been around oil. I hope we never, ever see another war, but I fear if we do see them over time, increasingly they might be around water. And it's just the right thing to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, um, do you have any tips on maximizing your productivity and managing your time? Um, yeah, I have a couple thoughts that I could um, share. Um, I, like, I like doing a check-in on, on, on where things are at and, and, and where it is I'm at in a current state, whatever that is. It could be a business, it could be a product line, it could just be me, right? wow, I'm really in an agitated way, or wow, I'm feeling really productive, or wow, I'm feeling really sort of lost. But what is current state? That's step one. Step two is what is the aspirational state? Can I imagine what it is that I really want this product to do? Can I imagine where I want this business to be? Can I imagine myself in a peaceful, centered state? whatever that aspirational future state is. I believe that, that once I know what my current state is, and I'm being rigorously honest with myself about that current state, and I visualize what the future state is that I want it to be, then it becomes very clear to me the actions that I could take to get from current state to future state. 
And then I think I'm able, again, to feel the reward that what I'm doing is getting me on that path to that future state, not just any future state, but my aspirational future state, or the actions that I'm taking are not. I mean, if uh, my aspirational state is to get a degree with a certain academic record at an LMU, and I find myself um, loading the troops in my Clash of Clans village, it's probably not helping me to get to my aspirational state. You don't offer a class in Clash of Clans, do you? I don't. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, so, so to me, that helps me to maximize my time because I can do a continual check-in. Is this helping me to get to my aspir aspirational state or not? And then if over time, if my behaviors don't match that, then I get to ask myself, are my behaviors telling me, is this really what I want to do or not? So I don't know if there's any nuggets there for you, but some of that works for me. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of like similar products at, like, at, like, that Belkin makes that other companies make too. How are you able to differentiate yourself? Because... Dr. DeMello mentioned that 90% of people who have uh, computers or some softwares like that, they have Belkin products. So how are you able to stand out from the crowd? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really key question. So where it is we start is um, what's, what's the consumer experience? What's the aha moment that we're hoping to um, create for um, folks? And... To your point, there's a bunch of other people thinking about working hard to um, do the right thing. So we, we need to do that better or at a better value or earlier than the other folks that are working hard to uh, make the same thing happen. So it's a lot of time spent with a high degree of empathy about what this usage looks like for them, folks as to how we can really unlock that. And then a lot of time spent on tech, what it allows us to sort of do today, what it might allow us to do in the future. We couldn't have done, Uber couldn't have been created 10 years ago, right? You could have the idea, but you couldn't make it happen because navigation wasn't robust enough yet. There wasn't a way to do background checks electronically. There was no e payment system. And so then that intersection of when the tech's going to allow us to, to um, sort of unlock that experience. And then we stay really close to the customer voice. That, that Velop thing that I, that I showed you that offers whole home mesh Wi-Fi in your home, um, uh, there's, I don't know, seven other folks making a whole home Wi-Fi mesh system, right? The highest rated system on Amazon today is Velop. It doesn't guarantee we are going to win, but if the customer feedback loop is that these, these guys are doing it best, it, it um, increases our odds. It's a really good question. It's one that we're, is top of mind for us every single day. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, as an entrepreneur, like, what advice would you give to someone who has an idea but doesn't know where to start? Um, go for it. <laughs> Just go. I, I, I remember I was ready to go with Belkin, and I was talking to my mom and, and my dad. And I was, I didn't realize it, but I was kind of like talking myself out of it. I go, look, I don't know anything about accounting. I don't know anything about this. I don't know anything about, you know, blah, 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 blah. My dad goes, don't worry about it. Just start. People are going to clamor to get their hands on what it is you're doing, or they're not. And if they're not, you don't need to worry about the accounting so much. 
And if they are, my guess is you'll probably find a way to get some help or to figure the rest of that stuff out. I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know that when I sold to a consumer, I was supposed to collect sales tax. <laughs> and when I started to collect sales tax, I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it. I kept it. <laughs> it turns out you're not supposed to keep it. You're supposed to send it into the State Board of Equalization. They actually expect that money to come, you know? We didn't have any health insurance for anyone, right? We couldn't afford it, right? We didn't know how to get it. We couldn't afford to get it. It didn't matter. I didn't have it. No one else had it either. We have a beautiful health plan now. Uh, we, we didn't have any workers' compensation insurance. I mean, I didn't even know such a thing even existed. Somebody came from L.A. County, the assessor's office, and said, hi, I'm from the assessor's office. I go, hi. And they go, well, we're here to do an inspection of your thing. I go, well, I don't know who you are or whatever it is. is it? No, 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 no. We're going to go in, we're going to assess the value of all of your equipment here, and then you get a tax bill. They go, you're kidding me. <laughs> they go, nope. So, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I knew that we wanted to be focused on people. I knew that we wanted to be of service. I knew that we wanted to create delightful user experiences. But I, I didn't know anything else. So just, just go. And if it doesn't work and another one comes, go with that one. Belkin was the um, eighth thing I tried. It wasn't the first one. I had a lawn mowing service first. I was going to be a rent to Santa Claus at Christmas time. Uh, I did a coupon trading thing. Uh, um, and, and finally, one day, I said, hey, I need to think about this in a different way. And I mentioned that I'm more of a his, history guy than a tech guy. I said, hey, these people that have had really big moments in time, you know, the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and, and uh, the Fords, some, some of those folks, Howard Hughes, right over here, right? is when something new was really launching in a really big way. Um, and those people could afford to get a lot of things wrong because the market grew so much. And so I said, well, what, what's, what's, what's happening in 1981? And I didn't have to think for very long. It was, it was PCs. So if, if you want help or counsel on um, any of that stuff, uh, my wife Jan is smarter than I am. <laughs> So she will help you out. Sorry to um, commit you. And if she won't do it, I will be happy. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I guess I'm asking a <laughs> Hi, Chet. How are you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm like a 20-year-old college student, and I'm just wondering um, if you were to give yourself, your 20-year-old self, any professional or personal advice that you know <clears throat> now, what would it be? I would try to be as honest and as candid and as genuine and as authentic with me as um, I could be. Um, as I was starting Belk and I was, a, I was a student at a school almost as good as LMU. I was at uh, UCLA. <laughs> and uh, and uh, um, it, it wasn't, remember the question about managing your time, right? I said that I wanted to graduate from college, but I wasn't being honest with myself. What I really wanted to do was give Belkin a shot. And so I had this not honest aspirational state of graduating from UCLA. My true aspirational state was to give Belkin a go. And so I kept seeing my behaviors consistent with Belkin and not consistent with um, school. So. Um, I would want to start with being as honest, as candid, as, and as authentic and genuine with me as I could possibly be. And it's awesome if there's somebody you can feel really safe with where you can have that kind of dialogue. At that moment in time, I didn't feel safe with anybody, and so it was just me on me, um, which uh, I think is not as effective as if there's somebody in your circle you can really trust. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Good evening. Hi, good evening. Hi. I, you speak a lot in your talk and presentation about empathy. And I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about how, how or what you've done, what philosophies or approaches you've taken to sort of embed that in the culture of your organization. Sure. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question um, because I, I, I haven't found a, a great way to do it other than trying to lead by example and, and raising the awareness of it a lot. Um, empathy found me uh, by being in um, situations that I didn't like and coming to the conclusion that, wow, there's people in this spot a lot or, 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 or working with them other folks. And, and being able to change that perspective around. And if I choose to kind of wall myself off from that, then it's hard to have those experiences where I think that that really becomes a, a, a thing for, for me. So if, if you can think of something, I would love to hear it back from you, all of you. Um, so I try to lead by example and we try to talk about a lot. Have empathy for the um, end consumer and, and one another. Hey there, how's it going? Hi, I'm, I'm way up back I'm, here. I'm a well. Where are you? <laughs> way in the back. My hands up. Uh, All the way in the back. I don't see you, but I'm going to pretend. Right, this. right. Oh, by okay, this, now yeah. I see you. I was going to say, forget it. I'll just look like yeah. I see you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so regarding smart cities, you talked about that. Um, do you think we should focus on retrofitting the current infrastructure that we have um, or reimagining completely uh, new developments in the future? Okay, I'm at risk in get, getting in a lot of trouble. Um, we've got a point of view around this. I've got a point of view. And um, there's a conventional wisdom point of view that I'm not sure is completely um, honest. So, I fly a lot. Do any, some of you get in an airplane some of the time and fly someplace? When you're flying in and, out, in, in and out of LA and you're close to LAX, what do you see? Okay, what else do you see? What? In and out burger? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's your aspirational state is to be sitting in front of a protein double-double right now. <laughs> so the traffic's driving around some things, right? What, it's, what it is driving around is a bunch of buildings, right? There's a few fields, but it's mostly buildings. And almost all those buildings have a rooftop. And you know what is on that roof? There's a roof. In this sun-drenched city, why would we put a roof on buildings when it could have solar panels? And we soak in all of this beautiful sun, and all this stuff is, is lit up and, 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 and much, much more. The Public Utilities Commission, policymakers in Sacramento, the people we elect to office, utility companies, tell us, they're, they're on record, there's white paper saying this, that the best way to have solar is to go out to the desert and disrupt the snakes and the lizards and the, uh, the what do you call it, uh, Joshua trees, right? Disrupt all of this beautiful desert landscape with solar panels. Why do they tell us to do that as opposed to just putting solar panels on all of our roofs? I'm going to tell you why, okay? The way we pay for electricity is regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission, okay? They work with the people that either generate and sell us electricity or they buy the electricity from another generator and sell it to us. They're told the rate at which they can charge us for electricity, right? That's a part of the bill. How many people have you... How many of, of you get an electric bill? Oh, a few of you, okay. How many of you understand that thing, 
right? Okay, so you get charged for the kilowatts, right? That's, that's some urine usage. The first tier is at 10 cents a kilowatt, and then if you use as much electricity as Jan and I probably shouldn't share this, it gets up like 32.8 cents per kilowatt. So then there's a kilowatt charge, but below there, there's all those other charges. You know what those, all those other lines of money are below your kilowatt usage? These are additional assessments to pay for CapEx. You, most of your, a lot of your business students, right? You, you, you know what CapEx is, right? Capital expenditures, right? The more that utilities can run up their CapEx bill, who pays for the utilities CapEx? The consumer. So those are paying back on the CapEx bill. And do you think we, we get to pay them back penny for penny on the CapEx? Or do they make money on the CapEx? They make money on the CapEx. So the more CapEx you can create, the more money you can charge us, right? So if we stick all the solar panels out in the desert, then what do we have to do? We have to build all these transmission lines. Do you know how much it costs to build a transmission line, those big, hairy, crazy things going from these solar farms back to the local transmission station? I don't know how much it costs either, but I think it's an awful lot of money, right? So then that goes in our bill, and then the PUC says that, okay, you guys should, should, should be able to make like 8% on your money. Well, I wish somebody would, would come to me and say, hey, we will just give you 8% on your money, you know? So the net out of all of that is I don't think we need any of this smart grid stuff. I think it's all a bunch of cover. Uh, for things that we don't have to do. And what it is that it should be easy to do is just for us to take smart action as consumers and then aggregate that data, which will result in smart cities. Has anybody ever tried to put a solar panel on their house? Was it easy? <laughs> was it easy to get the permit? Okay. Was it... Was it, was it easy to get the okay to um, do it? I mean, everything's really cumbersome with a bunch of paperwork and everything, right? The web page is all green, right? It's all green. We're all in favor of plants and flowers and everything. But it's turned into, in my opinion, just hurdles to keep people from getting one. We have solar panels on Belkin. It took us a year and a half to get those things lit up. It's, it's just way too much work. So, no, I'm not an infrastructure uh, advocate. Just, just uh, let us sort of do our thing. I told you I was going to get in trouble. Okay. Right. It's 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Have a beautiful Thursday. Show a little bit of empathy, a little bit of love. To that person real, real next to you right now. Class is not dismissed just yet. Oh. We want, we want to uh, we want to present Chet Pipkin and his wife Janice with a little gift from our entrepreneurship center. Um, we should say a little bit extra about Jan as well. Um, I'm not only honored to um, have her as my wife, but uh, Jan's honored to be a member of the Board of Trustees for our very own Loyola Marymount University. So. so, thank you both for sharing your evening with us. We have uh, some bags, t-shirts, mugs, other goodies in there for you. Um, thanks so much for, for the talk, and thank you guys for coming. Uh, we will have another event like this in the spring semester, so keep, keep a lookout, and uh, have a great night.